while it's being loaded up. Thank you very much for asking me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the Indian electricity sector, which I'm afraid is the only connection to the title of this session. I apologize for that. Um, and I'm going to focus on the relationship of the electricity sector to air pollution, which is the area I work in. Um, mostly local air pollution problems, which we heard about actually from Manesh this morning, um, and also to some extent to greenhouse gases. So, the points I want to make are very simple. Coal fire generating capacity in India doubled between 2007 and 2015, and it's likely to double again by 2030. So, coal is, coal is important in India. It accounts for about three quarters of generating uh, generation, smaller percentage of generating capacity, but three quarters of generation. And in spite of the INDC, and India's climate commitments, which we also heard about this morning, it's very likely in 2030 that the same percentage, roughly three quarters, of electricity will come from coal in India. The local air pollution that's associated with coal-fired power plants is really substantial and is likely to grow. The estimate in 2011, and I'll talk about this study, suggests that 20% of the air pollution deaths which were about 600,000, as we heard this morning, um, are attributable to emissions from power plants. The question is whether environmental regulations are really adequate to deal with this. In December of 2015, India issued regulations on coal-fired power plants that are actually more stringent than the regulations in the United States. And the question is, what are those going to cost and what would be their impact? The other question, um, which Stephen Smith asked me to think about, this issue of you know what would actually shift the mix away from coal. Um, there was mention this morning of the coal cess, which has been doubled successively, and a big question is whether that really will have the impact of making coal competitive uh, with fossil fuel-free uh, sources. So this is showing you the growth of installed capacity in India from independence through 2014. It looks like capacity is increasing rapidly, which it is, but one of the interesting things about this is that if you look at 2014, installed capacity is 250 gigawatts. It's 1,000 gigawatts in the United States in 2014. Um, the average electricity consumption in India is 1,000 kilowatt hours a year, and it's 13, over 13,000 in the United States. So India does have a long way to go here. Um, it's also true that the bottom here, which is coal, is about 60% of installed capacity. The other thing, though, that's important to, to note is that there is this real increase in the rate of installation of capacity, which is largely attributable to electricity sector reforms in India, culminating in the 2003 Electricity Reform Act. So back in 2001, you have only 10% of installed capacity that's privately owned. By 2014, 38% of installed capacity is, is privately owned. And what's going on is that what is owned and operated by the state electricity regulatory commissions is going down from 63% to 35%. So there are big cha uh, changes taking place. So here you can actually see precisely, if you couldn't read it off the graph, the percentage of capacity associated with different fuel sources, and also the percentage of generation. <coughs> so, um, what, returning to some of the themes this morning, um, and these are actually WRI figures, so in 2012, electricity generation was 37% of India's greenhouse gases, and 54% of its over 50, well, 54% of its CO2 emissions. So what do the INDC call, does, what does this call for? And it calls for 40% of installed capacity to be fossil fuel free. In terms of what we might expect installed capacity to be in 2030, if you're going to meet the goal of 2.5 trillion kilowatt hours being delivered to people um, in India, you would need an installed capacity of roughly 700 gigawatts. Okay, it's currently around 200 currently under 300, 
the INDC says that 280 gigawatts of that's going to have to be fossil fuel free. And the plan is to make 63 of those 280 nuclear, which would be a huge increase in nuclear, a tenfold increase. 67 hydro, which is much more um, likely to be achieved but a fourfold expansion in renewables that are connected to the grid. And we're talking here about what's connected to the grid, not off-grid distributed generation. Okay. So the question is, you know, is this, is this really a very likely scenario? So if you look at what the Center for Policy Research has come up with, and Sam is affiliated with them, but um, analyses from Navros Dubosh, a more realistic scenario would be one that has less nuclear, uh, and therefore more renewables, but if you apply today's capacity factors to this mix, you're going to have still 78% of electricity coming from coal. So the important thing is coal is, is here to stay, at least for the, the near future. Um, as the INDC says, the goal here is to have more efficient coal. That's, that's what, you, what can you do, um, except to increase the efficiency of coal plants. Okay, so one of the things I have studied with colleagues at the World Bank and also students at the University of Maryland is looking at the efficiency of coal-fired power plants in India, comparing them to plants in the U.S. So these data, or the results on, that, on this slide, actually pertain to the stock of plants in 2008-09. So that's, that is a few years ago. But what you have is coal burned per kilowatt hour. This is across all plants, but private plants are not such a big part of the mix back in 2008-09. You have coal burned per kilowatt hour being 60% greater than in the United States. So from a perspective of pollution, and we're going to talk about air pollution in a minute, this has obvious consequences. This is occurring because the heating value of Indian coal is low. Um, it's something like, you know, on average, 6,500 BTUs per pound versus over 10,000 in the United States. And operating heat rates, the amount of uh, energy you need to, to create a kilowatt hour, is actually higher in part due to plant maintenance, or poor plant uh, maintenance. Um, the ash content of Indian coal is very high, between 30 and 50 percent. This is for domestic coal. And the sulfur content is not that high. It's about half a percent by weight. It's, so it's not, it's not like coal in Appalachia or Illinois. However, you know, when you look at what the pollution control equipment is on Indian plants, there's not a lot. Um, most well, plants do have electrostatic precipitators, but with the high ash content of Indian coal, it makes it hard for these to function. There are only three flue gas desulfurization units actually currently operating, although there are a couple planned. So these are, are scrubbers that actually take SO2 out of the air before you emit it. And so the result of, of this, these high amounts of coal being burned per kilowatt hour and the lack of pollution control equipment is what you see on this slide. So um, this is the year 2011-12 and Coincidentally, in that year, the SO2 emissions from Indian power plants and power plants in the U.S. are about the same. They're about 4.6 million tons of SO2. But when you look at the associated electricity generated in the U.S., the electricity being generated is almost three times as high. So you, you do have you know, high pollution here per kilowatt hour. PM emissions are also higher per kilowatt hour in India for reasons that we discussed. And so the question is, if you take all of these emissions, you put them through an atmospheric um, chemistry model to look at what the estimated impact is on ambient air pollution in India, you get results that are significant. Now, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, what does it mean that these emissions give you an increase in PM 2.5 of about 4 micrograms per cubic meter? That doesn't sound like much because the population weighted average exposure in India is about 47 micrograms per cubic meter. However, um, this is growing 
quarter of the, of the 47 micrograms is coming from burning of biomass and other sources. But to show what this does in terms of air pollution, these are, this is a map produced by a co-author and former bank staff person, um, Sharath Gatakonda, who works, who has a uh, urban emissions info in, in Delhi. And this shows you the impacts on PM2.5 and the darker uh, colors are higher um, impacts on PM2.5 from the emissions of these, of the 111 plants operating in 2011. And you can see that in the areas in India where, there, where the coal mines are located, you have big impacts on air pollution. And in fact, when you look at air pollution maps of India full stop, you know, the, the most heavily uh, polluted area is the area um, in the north along the border here. Um, and you can see that there is an association here with, with coal-fired power plants. So in 2013, Sharath and his wife Pooja Jawahar published a study which was funded partly by Greenpeace and the Conservation Action Trust, but was also published in a scholarly journal. Uh, it was called Coal Kills, and it looked at the impacts of coal-fired power plants on health in India. The estimates here, which were based on transferring dose response functions from the US using the Pope et al. study to India, estimated that there were you know, in the neighborhood of 100,000 deaths per year occurring, which was, you know, roughly speaking, if you go to 115,000, about 20% of what the global burden of disease estimated to be the deaths associated with air pollution in India that year. Okay, so what exactly are the emissions standards? Prior to December of 2015, there were standards to eliminate particulate matter coming directly out of power plants. They were lax compared to standards in Europe, but there were no limits on sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxides. There have been restrictions on the ash content of coal that can be burned in sensitive and critically polluted areas, but the idea that the ash content has to be less than 34% is not a very high bar. What happened in December of 2015 were emission standards that are really very stringent. And I'm not sure, well, when, when announced, no one said, gosh, this effectively means that you're going to have to put scrubbers on these power plants. The standards are stated in, in milligrams per normal cubic meter, which is what Europe, Europe and China do in terms of their standards. It's not the way we state them in the United States. So if I wanted to translate this into what we think of in the US, if we looked at the plants built after 2017, they, can't, they can't emit more than a tenth of a pound of sulfur dioxide per million BTUs of heat input. That is really, really low. It's somewhat, it's almost linear, so it would be two tenths of a pound of SO2 per million BTUs at the 200 mi a milligram level. But the point is, if you take a typical plant that is burning this 0.5% coal by weight, it's emitting about 1.3 pounds of SO2 per million BTUs once you do all the calculations. Okay, so the point is that really these are very, very stringent standards and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna cost a lot to implement them. Uh, one thing we happened to do was to start a study, actually it's a few years ago, with the same data set this was a plants that were running in 2008-9. So we had 90% of them, but since it was 2008-9, you know, this, this was only 68 megawatts. Coal capacity now is 165 <coughs> megawatts, it's a lot bigger. But what we wanted to do was to take the emissions coming out of these plants, run them through an air quality model to look at what the impact was on ambient particulate matter Put that information through a dose response function, see what would happen if you installed an FGD, a scrubber on the plant, look at the cost of retrofitting the scrubber, and figure out the cost per life saved. We figured out the, you know, 
statistically lives saved by putting the scrubber there and reducing fine particles. And so I'll tell you briefly the results of, of this study. So we estimated that for these 72 plants, the 68 megawatts, the lives loss just to sulfur dioxide, not to particulate matter or NOx, because those are also coming out of the plant, but we, we calculated conservatively about 18,000 lives lost due to sulfur dioxide. The average cost per life saved of installing a flue gas desulfurization unit was 131,000 US dollars. Whether that passes the benefit cost test, I'm not going to go into. Uh, for people here who have dealt with the value of a statistical life, you might suggest that this could possibly pass it if you transfer a value from the U.S. Um, using an income elasticity of one, but the point is $131,000 is still a lot of money. And one of the things that we found, which speaks to the issue of the efficiency of regulations, is that there were huge variations in the cost per life save across the 72 plants. They went from $25,000 to $1.2 These plants expose really different numbers of people, the cost of retrofitting a scrubber depends on the size of your boilers, and that's, that's the way it is. Um, the, the dots on this map actually show you the locations of the 30 plants out of the 72 that had the most deaths and, and also hence the most uh, reduction in deaths from installing scrubbers. And as I said, if you do look at a map of air pollution in India, PM 2.5 pollution, it also is concentrated in that, in this band. So these results are not surprising. It's also den the most densely populated part of the country. <clears throat> yeah, four minutes. Okay, I'll make it. Okay, so um, once again, this we wanted to look at the idea, you know, to show the notion that um, these uniform standards aren't necessarily the most efficient way to go. If you took the 30 plants that have the lowest cost per life saved, either for technical, for cost reasons, or because of the fact that they're exposing a lot of people, um, the average cost per life saved goes down by 50%. But clearly, you know, this, the latest increase really makes this a very significant tax. And the question is, will this, what effect will this really have? So I will stop. Thanks so much. Sure.